Great. So hello, everyone. It's good to be here, and thank you for joining me for the session. I know I'm just after lunch, so I don't know if it's you know sleepiness or energy that's going to come out. Uh, but uh, so we, we're here at Seamless North Africa. It's, it's a fantastic conference. It's been a great show, and the vibe throughout the day has been amazing. My name is Shyam Mohan. I manage uh, Start Path for Middle East and Africa at MasterCard. This is the startup engagement program that we have at MasterCard, where we look at working with later stage fintechs and startups, helping them scale by working directly with them and also you know, through our bank and merchant partners. Uh, in StartPath, we look at a broad area of topics, one of which is SMEs. And uh, today, we are going to talk about SME lending, whether it's boom or a bust, right? Looking at what are the trends and, and how technology is shaping this landscape. SMEs, as you all know, are quite vital to having a healthy economy, right? More than 99% of businesses that exist in the world are SMEs. And they are a significant contributor to employment in all the major economies. But they are also quite prone to risks, external business constraints. If you think about what happened during the previous recession, SMEs were the first and worst impacted. But at the same time, when things go well, when economies improve, they are able to get back on their feet fast enough and run at a much faster pace. One of the key pain points that the SME sector suffers is lack of access to good financing. And, and this is a problem across both developed and developing markets. IFC puts the global SME unmet credit gap at between 2.1 and 2.6 billion, sorry, trillion dollars. More than half of 400 million SMEs globally have unmet credit needs. And if you look at Middle East and North Africa, the, the financing gap is over $700 billion, which is a significant number, right? And, and what, do, what do SMEs need financing primarily for? So if you see, uh, basically, it's to maintain their cash flow and then to look at uh, buying inventory and invest in equipment just to you know, sustain and run their business. They don't have significant investment requirements. It's, in essence, just to run business in a profitable manner, in a sustainable manner. So why is this gap existing, and why is it such a large gap? If you, if you think about it, it's purely a demand-supply challenge. SMEs, uh, think about you know, an SME owner. They are more informal, but they still value speed and efficiency in getting access to finance. The, the requirements that are asked of them to access, access financing from bank is quite complex, not something which they are typically used to. They, they don't want to go through a complex application process, and obviously the interest rates that are charged are beyond what they can, uh, what, what they can uh, work on. But on the other hand, banks, which are primary lenders in any market, they consider SMEs to be risky. The cost of acquisition, underwriting, and servicing are high for a bank. And the revenue per account is quite low. So the key challenge here is that for a bank, you are talking about a segment where the revenue per account is low, but you already have a significantly high cost base you have complex processes and inflexible systems. Because of this challenge, they would rather work with a large corporate than focus on the SME sector. So is this good for the economy? The answer, obviously, is no. But what has been changing in this space? Over the past decade or so, we've seen the emergence of a lot of alternate lending service providers. So they are reimagining SME lending. They're looking at new sources of data. They're looking at new economic partnerships. They're looking at new credit 
credit models, and they are building a servicing structure which caters to this particular segment in a seamless, efficient manner. And these alternate lenders, they underpin their solution on technology which is scalable, which means that they don't have the high cost base that a traditional bank would have. As I said, they look at alternate sources of data. So typically when you go and apply for a loan today from a bank, whether you are an SME or a consumer, you're treated pretty much in the same fashion. Because from a bank's point of view, in the end, an SME is owned by an individual to whom the bank is lending the loan to. So how can you build a different perspective? How can you bring in a diverse perspective to this particular uh, approach? And that's where the new age fintech lending providers are looking at alternative sources of data. So they look at things like location information. They look at you know, the utility payments profile of an SME. They look at the social media profile. They look at call and SMS logs. And they look at psychometric data. And how do you make sense out of this data for you to lend to an SME? I was uh, reading about uh, you know, an, a, a, a micro lender in Kenya where the owner was mentioning that, just focusing on the location information, if you, if you take the location history of an SME, throughout the day, if a person or an SME owner is spending his time mostly between two or three locations, there is a 6% higher repayment rate, which means they are you know, kind of stable in their business. They are focusing on what they have to do to run their business. So if you think about it in a pure data point of view, this is not something that would typically come to your mind when it comes to a lending decision. But this is where these alternate lenders are looking at new sources of data and trying to make sense of them. And how are they doing it? So they, get, they gather a bunch of data, non-traditional data. It could be things like, let's say, you know, sellers on Amazon or Jumia or Soup.com. So if you can get access to the seller information or their transaction information on these e-commerce platforms. It could be things like your Yelp review or TripAdvisor review or let's say a hunger station review or a Talabat review. Right? How can you make sense of this, this information set? You can work with online accountancy firms, for example, you know, the likes of QuickBooks, get information about you know, the history of a company on that platform. Site building companies like GoDaddy, Right? How do you get data from these companies? And then put all these sources of information together. You run you know, various modeling solutions using artificial intelligence and machine learning. And then come up with an approach basis which you can take a solid decision. So the question that I have here is how realistic is this? Uh, if, if you think about a market like uh, US, Cabbage is a, is a great example, right? They are a big SME lender, an alternate lender, uh, you know, work with banks for the financing part, but then they do the lending for companies. If you look at what Cabbage does, they lend up to $150,000 for SMEs, and the approval process takes less than 10 minutes. They provide, you know, six to 12 month loans. If you're taking a six month loan, the minimum loan amount that you would have to take is $2,000. If it is a 12 month loan, you would have to take $10,000. But unlike most other traditional lenders, they don't ask you for a lot, a lot of history. They ask you for a minimum of one year of business data. So you have to be in existence in business for a year, and that's pretty much what they see as a minimum requirement for lending. In terms of revenues, they don't look at you know, big balance sheets. If you uh, have done $50,000 in the previous year, or $4,200 per month in the past three months, that's good for you to apply for a loan through Cabbage. So this is, you know, again, a US market, which over time has evolved into such a structure. It took Cabbage 10 years to reach where they are today. But it doesn't mean that we cannot apply similar approaches to developing markets like, like Egypt or other markets around us, right? So, it's about understanding what are the available sources of information. Start, start with what you have. Try and build on that. And over time, you will be able to build a model which will help you service this you know, large SME base. So if you are a fintech, 
the question should not be, can, can you fill a void that is left out by the banks? But the question has to be, why have banks left this, this void untouched? You can't take a bank head on and try to you know, disrupt the bus their business because they have large customer bases and, and, and money. As an alternate fintech service provider, the approach that you have to take is to collaborate with, with banking institutions. You should go and tell a bank, please provide me you know, data of who you have lent to in the past. I will use that data to you know, build an underwriting model, and then I can you know, build an efficient model and promise that I can give you, let's say, 30 or 40% better results than what you currently have. Why will a bank not be open to that approach? It takes a while. It's easy to say, but it takes a while. But this is what has happened in most markets where SME lending with alternative uh, lenders and service providers have succeeded. It takes time to build the trust. You start with you know, small experimental sets of data and build POCs. But over time, you build a relationship, and that's how you will be able to uh, cater to the market. What is also important to look at is the regulatory landscape. So in most markets now, SME lending and regulations around SME lending are being focused in a significant manner. And Egypt is a great example where you know, there is a regulation in place where banks have to lend 20% of their book to SMEs at, uh, at an interest rate that is capped at 5%. Right? So regulators obviously come in play and support this because they understand the value of SMEs in driving the economy and, and helping in the growth of you know, the GDP of the country. But one thing that is also important to consider, uh, so these are uh, you know, policies and, and frameworks of companies like, let's say, Google or Facebook. Because again, since you are depending on non-traditional sources of data, you cannot work without dipping into all the available data pools, including you know, uh, social media profiles, et cetera. So whenever their policy frameworks change, you need to be aware of them and account for them and change your models accordingly. Uh, previously, you know, a lot of companies used to look at SMS scraping and email scraping to get a lot of data. All of a sudden, in October of 2018, Google you know, created this new rule saying that they are restricting email scraping. So, don't be reliant on one particular aspect of data source to build your model. You should obviously consider whatever is available, but you should also de-risk the engagement that you, that you would be having when it comes to working on these uh, non-traditional sources of data. So uh, as I said, you know, in StartPath, we look at uh, fintechs and startups and try to work together. One of the predictions that we made uh, in 20 in early this year is that 2019 is going to be a year where SMEs are going to be a fintech battleground. But then the point that I want to highlight here is that it's not just about lending. Now there are companies that are looking at various aspects of engagement when it comes to working with SMEs. So it's about you know, insurance, it's about providing accounting tools and softwares, it's about uh, cross-border payments that, that is facilitated as a, as a need for these SMEs procurement processes, payments. So when you are thinking about product development in this space, think about verticalization. Don't just focus on one aspect, because as I mentioned in the beginning of uh, this discussion, even though SMEs are informal, they value speed, they value efficiency, and they value relationships. So think about verticalized you know, industry-level solutions that you are providing to the SME base, and then try to work with partners to, to build products around it. So, and what is MasterCard doing in this space? We launched a platform called Kionect uh, in, in Kenya. Uh, so we also launched another version called Jasaduka with Unilever uh, in, in Kenya. So for us as MasterCard, our vision is you know, a world beyond cash. But when you think about the SME space, we cannot just focus on a single problem of converting their cash transactions into digital transactions. As I mentioned earlier, think about their broader pain points and, and, and how we can help solve for them. So through Kionect, which is short form for Kiosk Connect, what we are doing is 
we are building a platform where traders you know, can get access to, let's say, wholesalers and other uh, market information, which enables them to buy and sell products and use digital payments as the underlying payment mechanism. So this ensures that you are now able to capture a lot of data about the transactions that these SMEs are doing and build and, and use this data to build credit lending models. Another example is we've launched a product called MasterCard Farmer Network in, uh, in, in Tanzania. So again, farmers financially excluded, nobody wants to touch them, banks don't want to work with them. But for us, we know that financial inclusion is important and these are individuals who need to get access to you know, good rates for their produce, access to faster uh, methods of payments, etc. So through MasterCard Farmer Network, what we are doing is, if for example, I, I'm a farmer with one uh, ton of wheat that I've produced, through this platform, I can inform the market that this produce is available. And, and then I can receive bids for this particular product or, or this particular lot and ensure that I get the right access to the market. And payments happen in a digital method. And within StartPath, we are looking at fintechs that are servicing the SME space. So it's not just about lending, it's about various aspects of the SME value chain that these fintechs are touching. So we have companies that are doing digital onboarding. So banks can use you know, digital onboarding solutions to, to get information about the SMEs. We look at uh, companies that are in the instant credit and loan provision services for SMEs. We look at companies that are in the underwriting space. Now, Lending Front is a US-based company. It's, it's a good example because what they are doing is they are improving the process of servicing a loan. So as a bank, you don't have to have a, you know, a sales team of 100 going after these SMEs. Lending Front, for example, digitizes the process of loan servicing. And it, it allows you as a bank to you know, put your valuable resources to large corporate accounts that are generating more revenue for you. Providing economical POS systems, so things like tap on phone, converting your you know, smartphone into a contactless acceptance device, uh, sound-based payments technologies, which is what Tontag is doing. Uh, Bill Pocket is a company that provides uh, cheap and efficient MPOS solutions. Then we look at e-commerce acceptance. We look at expense management solutions and, and cross-border transactions. So as I mentioned earlier, when you think about product development or when, you want, when, when you're thinking about capitalizing the SME space, you need to verticalize, you need to understand what the broader pain points are, and you need to work with whatever data sources are available to ensure that you are catering to this segment. So in conclusion, don't think about these relationships as transactional for just a loan or two. These have to be lifetime relationships that you are nurturing with the SME segments, even though they may not be the most profitable ones for you. But over time, you build a relationship, they start you know, trusting you and they want to transact with you, and that's when this underserved need would be met. You need to consider credit risk and operational risk when you are working with the SMEs, obviously. But at the same time, work closely with policymakers to build a framework that will allow regulations to support this. Thank you. That was all about the SME lending boom or bust story. And a parting statement, which is a personal opinion of mine, is that even though SMEs were significantly impacted in the previous recession, God forbid if another recession were to come later in the future with different you know technologies and methodologies that are being used to service them i think the impact will not be as bad as it was previously thank you